Hello everyone, my name is Jill and this is Bill. We're here at Mustang Library and we're going to be discussing a little bit about overseeding with you. But before we get to that, just a few bits of information that you might find helpful. If you are interested in library services and a lot of the cool virtual programming that's coming up, check out the library website for new hours and for information on that virtual programming. And today, we're going to be talking about this really cool overseeding winter grass into Bermuda grass turf resource from the University of Arizona. You should be able to access this PDF next to the video. We will also be discussing a little bit of information from our publication, Landscape Watering by the Numbers, shown here. You can reach out to us to get a personal copy for your home. Um, you will also have access online to a digital copy as well as a resource from our partnership with Water Use It Wisely where you can put a little bit more information related to your specific home and your specific plant types and irrigation system. Without further ado, Bill, the star of our show. So we're going to talk about the overseeding process and is overseeding actually necessary? Um, it's actually a little bit hard on the existing grass. Our Bermuda grass is our summer lawn and it's there for mm, half of the year or should be half of the year. And we have to come in in the winter time when it starts to go dormant and if we want to have winter lawn, we have to add the seed to the lawn. A lot of the practices that we've done throughout the past are very detrimental to the Bermuda grass. So this is an attempt to kind of rectify some of the situations and uh, give you the proper information on how to do it right. Now, do you have to do it? No, absolutely not. Um, if you have a purpose to have a nice winter lawn, I mean, if you're having a wedding in your backyard or if your pet needs a place to play and, and you're gonna spend lots of time there, those are perfectly good reasons to have a winter lawn. Um, we in water conservation have nothing against winter lawns or against lawns in general. They are um, a critical part of our xeriscaping style in our landscape and they actually cool your environment and make it pleasant and enjoyable. Um, you could always plan to do just like a partial, you know, if you have more than one area, you could do an area so that you do have a little green to enjoy. But do you have to do it all? You know, it can be problematic. Um, we in the city of Scottsdale and a lot of other cities in the valley do what we call three month winter averaging in the winter time to judge how much water this customer is using so that we can determine what your new sewer charges are going to be. So if you have an extensive winter lawn and you are not very efficient, the extra water use could dramatically increase your sewer charges. So just a little thought, not just the water that you're gonna, the money that you're gonna spend on the water during the winter months, but it could affect your sewer charges for the next 12 months. So with that, let's talk a little bit about the process. Um, in the past, it was traditionally called thatch and scalp and thatch and scalp sound like they're very aggressive techniques and they really are. They were detrimental to the Bermuda grass. So we're gonna talk about doing it in a much gentler way and trying to stretch out the process over a little bit more time to make it easier to facilitate doing it uh, the best way possible. So with the Bermuda grass, um, overseeding is generally done in October, um, sometimes late October, it all depends on temperature. We're waiting for about 80 to 85 degree days and about 55 degree nights. Um, that's when the temperature is just right. It's still plenty warm to get seed to germinate rapidly, um, but it's not so warm that the Bermuda grass feels like it needs to uh, compete with the ryegrass. So um, there's lots of different kinds of ryegrass. There's annual ryegrass and there's intermediate grasses that are mixes between annual varieties and perennial varieties. Um, Annual ryegrass is a lot wetter. Uh, you get the green tennis shoe effect from it when you mow. Um, perennial ryegrasses are generally finer texture and um, 
uh, nicer, they grow a little slower, they're, they're a much darker color. They're usually a blend of probably like three different kinds of seed. Uh, one that's good in cold weather, one that's good in warm weather, one that's in there for its color. So they blend three types of seed in a perennial ryegrass and it is what most people are going to use if they overseed their turf. As your Bermuda turf is, it's, it's out there and it's you know, supposed to be your summer lawn, it's supposed to be the permanent lawn, and the overseeded grass is temporary. Well, we've had a little bit of a, of a changeover in where people put it in sooner and try to water it way too much into the heat and try to extend it longer than it really should be. It's generally uh, should be around from October, November until about April or May, and that's the most it should be. Um, in order to keep it around longer, you have to water it a lot more and it would probably be you know, detrimental to your water bill to do it as much as it would take. Um, right around 100 degrees, the ryegrass can no longer take it. It's going to all die out. Um, a lot of times you'll have ryegrass underneath the shade of your trees for a little bit longer um, than you would have it in the open areas where the sun shines. So, if you're doing the overseed process, it helps to start early. About uh, 30 days before overseeding, you would want to stop with any type of fertilizer program that you're doing. You don't need to fertilize that grass. If you uh, stop it from uh, you know, producing new tissue, it gets the sense that it needs to start going into the phase where it's going to store energy. The Bermuda grass, in the, as temperature starts to come down, realizes that it needs to stop growing uh, green leafy tissue or what we call vegetatively and it starts sending energy down to its root systems to help store energy so that it can come back and be a, a beautiful lawn in the spring of the next year. So if we stop those fertilizer programs we're, we're starting the process to tell it to slow down. It's time to, time to go to sleep. Um, 14 days before overseeding we'd like to raise the height of the grass either by raising it by 30 or 40 percent or maybe just skipping a couple of mowings um, and let it get long and luxurious. Um, you also at that time would probably want to decrease the water by about 30 percent. In the past we would turn the water off. You do not want to turn the water off. It's detrimental to the Bermuda grass. Um, it needs to have that water and it needs to finish storing the energy that it needs. Um, if your grass is really, really thick and you haven't been doing verticutting through the summertime when the grass was actively growing, um, 30 days out is probably the last chance you're going to get to do some thinning to get it a little bit thinner so that it's easier and less work at the time of overseeding. If you've got to thin it and do the overseeding, it's, it can be a lot of work. So we want to do some of the work ahead of time to save on the end, on the end product. Um, about one to three days before you are about to put the seed on, that's when you would turn the water off so that you can do a little bit more work and not be in any moisture whatsoever. Um, nobody would want to work in the dirt and the dust and that was, that was kind of how it was in the past. Um, they would turn the water off for a month thinking that next month I'm going to water like crazy and it, the process would be dirty and dusty and bad for the air quality. So yeah. We don't want to do that. We want to gradually turn the water down and only have it off for about three days. On that day, or when you turn that water down, you'd want to mow and you would want to reduce the height back down to the height that you used to mow at. You just let it get kind of long and luxurious. And what you're going to do is you're going to cut off most of the green of the blade and you're going to go down to just stems. It'll be brown and it'll be a little, a little bit uh, crispy probably look like a fresh crew cut, you know what I mean? Scalping is what we used to do, and, and scalping is literally removing the grass all the way down to the soil. Well, with Bermuda grass, there are little pieces of grass that grow across the top of the ground. We call them stolons, and stolons are very important to the establishment of the grass in the next year. If we totally remove all those stolons, we're going to have bare spots that are going to take quite an effort to get filled back in in the next year. So we don't want to do anything that resembles the thatch and scalp of the old, older days. Different varieties of Bermuda grass 
generally get mowed at different heights. So lots of uh, common Bermuda grasses get mowed very, very tall. Some of our mid-iron grasses get mowed, you know, an inch, inch and a half. And some of our, our higher quality varieties of uh, hybrids of Bermuda grass get mowed much lower, but they get mowed with a different kind of mower. Sometimes you use a rotary mower that cuts the grass with a blade spinning like this. But there's another kind of mower for those finer textured grasses that are more like putting greens or baseball fields that has a reel that cuts like this up against a blade. That's called a reel mower. The other mower is not a fake mower, but a reel mower is the kind of mower that you would use for finer textured Bermuda grasses. At the process of uh, getting ready to put the seed on, if you still have too thick of a grass, you may need to do a little bit more verticutting because ideally the seed would be able to filter down through whatever stubble that you have there and actually make contact with the soil so that when its roots pop out, it's touching soil so it can drop its roots into soil. So that's one of the things that we're concerned about. Um, there are processes that should be happening in the summertime. One of them is that verticutting. Um, the grass, when the grass is actively growing, that's when you want to be doing these pr processes that are aggressive on it, like aerifying and, uh, and verticutting, or as some people call it, power raking. So, um, how much seed do we use when we overseed? Well, when the time is right and we've checked our irrigation system and we, we're sure that when we go to turn that water on that it's going to happen just correctly, um, a lot of times during the process we damage something, so we have to check that before we put our seed down. It's no fun to uh, put your seed down and then find out you have an irrigation uh, issue and then you have to walk out there and it's wet and the seed starts sticking to your feet and then when it germinates you can see your footprints. <laughs> so that's not a good program, so we don't want to do that. Um, so we're going to use about anywhere from 10 to 15 pounds of seed per thousand square feet. Um, 12 to 15 is desirable. 10, if you're, you know, if it's just an area that you want to look green, it doesn't have to have 12 to 15 pounds of seed on it. Uh, from a distance, it's going to look great. But if you're going to be walking on it and you want it to be thick and luxurious, somewhere between 12 and 15 pounds of seed are going to be required. So um, ryegrass at 12 to 15 pounds per thousand square feet. A lot of times, um, once you've cut your grass down and you've got it down to a stubble that's a half inch to three quarters of an inch, and you apply your seed, you would apply your seed in, in perpendicular directions. One set of passes going one way and another set of passes going the other way, putting on like half of the seed each time to get a nice even coating of seed out over the surface area. Mm -hmm. So let's do a little review. So. We're going 30 days before overseeding, we want to stop the nitrogen. Um, 14 days, re let the height get a little bit longer um, and decrease your irrigation by about 30%. So if you're running 15 minutes, cutting it down to 10 minutes, you know, those are that's a 30% reduction. About one to three days before doing it, get the water turned off so that you're not working in any wet spots. Then you're gonna mow right before you put the seed down, you'll get the height down. Now, if you have a, a need to have that finer texture that's gonna get mowed at a lower height, there's a good chance that you could run your real mower over it. A lot of people will rake it or drag it to get the seed to actually fall down off, off, of, the, off of the grass stubble, but you can use a real mower and mow it just a little bit more off the top and it'll land on top of the seed, it'll hide it from the birds a little bit better. Um, one of the things that we're, we're talking about is uh, the 12 to 15 pounds per thousand and then it's time to run the irrigation system. So irrigation is, uh, we're not watering very deep once we put the seed on. The goal is just to keep the seed moist so it doesn't dry out so that it germinates correctly. So depending on your irrigation system, you're going to run it um, a fast irrigation system only for a few minutes, but three or four times a day every day for the next seven to ten days for germination. With, the, with adequate uh, temperature during the daytime, that's going to work out really good. After about ten days, you should have a really good rate of germination. As temperature goes down, 
the length of time it takes to get germination goes up. And if the temperature goes down quick during the process, that's when we might use some mulches, but we don't generally add mulches unless the temperature has gone down. If we do our timing right, we don't really need to add the mulches to the soil. So a less aggressive approach, we don't want to thatch and scalp, we just want to cut things down to a stubble and leave as much of the Bermuda grass over the surface area. Get that seed on, get it down to the soil, water it, should come up and should look great. So about, uh, the, about the time that you want to reduce the water down and start, uh, start mowing is when you're going to make your first application of fertilizer. Um, generally, the, if, if it's still warm out, we would use an ammonium phosphate that is like about a 16, 20, 0. And that's going to be a very adequate uh, fertilizer, the, the middle number. The first number in a fertilizer is always the nitrogen, and that produces the green leafy tissue growth. The second number is the phosphorus, and phosphorus is always used for roots, shoots, fruits, and flowers. And in this case, we're using it for roots because we want to develop the root system of this new plant that we just planted, the grass seed in our Bermuda. The first time that you're going to mow, you just don't, you want to barely cut the tips off the top of the, the new ryegrass. What the ryegrass plant can do, each plant can send up another blade and it can do it up to seven times. It's called tillering, but if you cut it too short, that blade will die and you'll start off again with another blade maybe, if you're lucky if you didn't kill that particular plant. And you'll just, you'll, you'll just won't develop a thick lawn as fast. So tillering is very important. Anytime you cut your grass, whether it's Bermuda grass or rye grass, you never cut off more than a third of the length of the blade at one time. So in the beginning, we're just barely nipping, ideally to have a nice freshly sharp mower since you had probably about two or three weeks since the seed went down that the mower could go out and get serviced and get the blade sharpened. And then that nice clean fresh cut is gonna be really uh, advantageous so that that grass does that process of tillering. Spring transition, we're gonna talk about uh, after we've got this uh, ryegrass in place and we've gone through the winter and we reduce the water and uh, we'll talk about the watering aspects of uh, the winter time after germination here in a minute but um, we're going to run into a period where the bermuda grass is going to start to grow again and we're we want to transition the rye grass out at that point um, we don't want to just keep watering it and, and keeping it around longer than what we really need to because it will create competition for our Bermuda grass when the Bermuda grass only has about a hundred days that it's actively growing and can fill in the spots where the ryegrass was. So we want to do things to work it out of the lawn. One of the best things that we can do is to reduce the height of the mow for a couple of weeks to cut the green blades off of the ryegrass the way we did to the Bermuda grass before we started uh, to seed. And that in turn tells it it's time to go away. Um, when you get your grass to about an 80% Bermuda grass, you can actually do a light verticutting to get the rest of it out and then a light fertilizing and boom, start watering again, get back to your normal watering cycle and you should be able to bring your winter lawn back and have a, a beautiful summer lawn as well as a beautiful winter lawn. All right, so that's the process. Watering by the numbers is your guide to watering all your, all your landscape materials throughout the winter and through the, through the cold weather, the secret to being successful is reducing how often that water occurs. Um, generally, we don't reduce how much water that we're applying to things, we just reduce how often it occurs. So the roots don't get smaller. What happens is the drink of water starts to last longer because it's not hot. So on the back of the watering by the numbers is the little yellow card that's meant for you to take out and put into your irrigation controller so that you have a little piece of reference material that talks about in the winter time watering desert trees only about once every 30 to 60 days. Watering high water use trees like your citrus trees once every 14 to 30 days, depending on how established they are. Um, high water use shrubs, like your rose bushes, only would need to be watered about once every 10 to 14 days. Um, ground covers and annuals, 
Believe it or not, your garden vegetables only need to get watered about once every four or five days in the winter time. If you're gardening in your, in your yard and you have things and it's not hot, well, the plant's not using water to cool itself off, so it's going to stick around a lot longer. So everything that I'm talking about, even your grass watering schedule, your grass watering schedule for cool season grass, once every seven to 14 days. Um, in really cool weather, there's not gonna be any water being used and we can get out to about 14 days. But for the majority of the winter, you'll probably be watering your lawn with three quarters of an inch of water about once every seven days. And you can find all that information online at Scottsdale Water or at Water Use It Wisely. And it's through the brochure, Watering by the Numbers. With that, we'll call it overseeded.